So I propose that we start five minutes early, um, and then we can chat after the quick mini lecture for as long as you guys like. Um, Mitchell Hoyer uh, is ill, and therefore the last teaching piece that he had designed um, is not going to be presented, but Joffer and Aaron are still here, and Kaylin is here, and all of us are educators on one level or another, so if you have lingering curricular questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about health equity and stigma reduction. Just because it's brief doesn't mean that it's a small topic. If anything, it's an incredibly big topic. Um, and uh, I've picked out a few issues to kind of get you thinking uh, more than anything else. I'm far enough away from you that I can take off my mask. Okay, so um, this is me. I have had a very non-traditional path in academic medicine and I wear a lot of hats. Um, since 2016, I've been doing work in my institution around pain and opioids. A lot of my work has been community facing and in fact, I started volunteering um, with um, advocacy groups and that's how I actually got tapped to do work within the hospital and to do work within the Injury Prevention Center. Um, so a little bit not the way it usually happens. Um, so just to ground the conversation, health equity and access to health care is a societal issue. It's not just an emergency department issue or just a, a medical issue. Um, it's certainly influenced by our built environment, our communities, our income, our income security, our education, and m many other factors. Um, I think we need to keep that in mind as we talk about uh, equity and also stigma. Um, with regards to stigma, um, the young woman from uh, Houston, whose name I'm now blanking, Daisy, um, brought up the issue of stigma within her department um, related to patients with substance use disorder. Um, words matter. This is a real problem. It's a problem within healthcare. It's a problem within our communities. It's even a problem um, with our patients who have internalized stigma, and there is also stigma within the recovery community around um, medication for opiate use disorder. So when you're thinking about the words that you use um, regarding patients with substance use disorders, really be mindful of what you say, how you say it. There is an often quoted um, study where um, patients were either referred to, for example, as a substance abuser versus um, a patient having a substance use disorder, and they found that the perception of that individual was completely different based on the words that were used, and the negative perception was completely different. There are many other studies um, in uh, neuro uh, and uh, in psychology showing this for mental illness as well as for substance use and, and other uh, conditions and just kind of uh, 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 groups that patients belong to or individuals belong to. Um, the green and blue is a um, downloadable Word document on the injury prevention website. You can put your own logo on it if you would like. Um, I can send you the master document if you would like. Um, it is kind of free for anybody to use. Um, the way that we talk about and portray patients with substance use has definitely uh, changed over time. Um, I actually remember that Time Magazine um, cover and many others that were very um, negative in their portrayal. Um, the war on drugs used photography uh, to fan outrage uh, within the public. There was a lot of um, dialogue around protect 
protecting American values, protecting children, protecting the family. Um, and the dialogue was often one of personal failure, corruption, moral weakness, deviant behavior. Um, the media and politicians definitely used those, um, those words um, and those ideas to sell papers um, and uh, get TV viewers and even get votes. Um, the current portrayal, uh, particularly of opiate use disorder, uh, opiate um, use disorder patients is much more sympathetic. The language is much, much more sympathetic. Uh, I don't know how many of you read the New York Times, but there was an article about um, the opioid epidemic, and every picture was of a um, young white person with their cherubic child. Um, and it was quite jarring, to be perfectly honest, after um, growing up in Newark, New Jersey, um, at the midst of the crack epidemic, where the images were so pejorative and so punishing. Um, but, you know, the difference is the opioid epidemic uh, primarily affects uh, white um, middle class folks, and they are victims of big pharma as opposed to morally corrupt uh, and, um, yeah, anyway. Um, stigma can be internalized. Here are three representative articles that are in the Google Drive that uh, we will share with you. Um, and uh, stigma can also be within healthcare. However, um, there are a lot of ways that we can address this within ourselves and within our colleagues. Um, and there's a lot of research around how to combat stigma and uh, implicit bias. Um, so it's not hopeless. We can do better. Um, so a few things to consider as you think about stigma within your own institution. Um, many of you are leaders, whether you realize it or not. Um, I think all physicians have the possibility of being a leader within their, uh, within their community, within their team. So education is incredibly important, and this is education of us as healthcare workers, but also the public, uh, patients, lawmakers, government, police. Um, so, you know, education regarding the detrimental effects of stigma, education uh, regarding uh, the criminalization of SUD and the fact that it doesn't help anybody, uh, and often it's inappropriate. Um, and, um, you know, uh, education regarding the evidence-based uh, interventions that we have been talking about all morning. Um, again, mind your language. People listen. Um, I've, I've had nurses say, why are you talking about this in that way? And then we have a conversation about language. Um, and maybe it changes how they talk about it at the bedside, right? Um, I, think, uh, I think our patients definitely hear not only the words that we use, but our intent. Um, and every time they have a touch with the healthcare system, we have the potential of doing good and showing them that we are there as allies to help them um, and take care of them, or that we are judgmental and not interested in, uh, in caring for them. Um, I think the last thing that often physicians don't think about is the fact that we need to advocate for example, for medical insurance coverage um, that is equal for uh, a medical issue like heart failure versus a behavioral health or SUD issue. Um, these are chronic conditions and patients need uh, support um, long term. Here are some really nice resources around stigma. The anti-stigma toolkit is maybe about 10 years old from SAMHSA, but I think it still has a lot of really awesome um, information. Uh, Massachusetts has a really nice um, stigma campaign. Um, Michigan has a really nice stigma campaign. In Beat the Stigma is a game, um, but you know, however you can engage your team and get them thinking about this, um, I think can be really helpful. 
I'm Still a Person is an anti-stigma toolkit put together by Families Against Narcotics. Um, and the Unicorn Project is local to my community where people in recovery took photos of themselves and told their story. And the whole idea was, I look just like you, I am just like you, I found a way to be more healthy, to engage in recovery, this is my story, uh, and to you know, inspire people uh, to not feel like they can't do it too. Um, equity is, again, an, in, an enormous issue in our society, and of course, it touches patients with SUD. Um, it is uh, increasingly understood and acknowledged that um, substance use disorders are uh, a biological, a physiological, as well as a social health condition with a lot of risk factors. Um, and these risk factors uh, can be, you know, uh, familial, um, genetic, uh, as well as situational, um, and that's part of the equity um, conversation. Um, when we look at patients with OUD, they're predominantly white, male, and young adults, but this is changing. Um, this data is from uh, 2017 from the Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, but as we look um, more recently, um, we're seeing um, that um, uh, people of color have rates of overdose death that exceeds um, white uh, individuals, and this is um, a problem that is becoming increasingly recognized across the country. The exact causes are not yet known, um, but it's certainly something to think about as you think about harm reduction and who gets harm reduction and what kind of harm reduction do they get and what impact does that have on their risk of overdose. Um, so this is some uh, information from uh, Michigan. We have the opioid uh, dashboard, which is a fantastic resource. Um, and you can see the blue line where um, African-American patients have a significantly higher uh, overdose uh, death rate um, than other ethnic groups. Um, this is, these are some images from uh, SAMHSA looking at who has SUD, who has OUD, and who actually gets treatment. And you can see the bubbles get smaller with each. Um, alcohol is still the highest, um, uh, alcohol use disorder still has the highest percentage of folks getting treatment. Um, but it's a big problem and not enough care uh, is available to patients. This is the last year of data available. And the things that I want uh, to point out are among individuals 12 or older, um, about 15% equating to about 41 million people needed substance use treatment uh, of one sort or another. And um, uh, my slide is not working. Uh, and um, only uh, about 6% received the treatment that they needed. Um, and the other thing I want to call out is look at how many patients are getting help through a self-help group, which we know is not as effective as a multimodal uh, intervention, including medication for those um, where it's appropriate. Again, lots and lots of research looking at equity um, in substance use disorder treatment. Um, you know, who gets treatment? Where does it occur? What are they offered? And as a example, this is a um, article by Pooja Lajasetti, one of my colleagues who helped to uh, create the addiction consult team that we now have in our uh, hospital and that Nate leads. 
um, what they found was that patients who are private pay or fully insured are much more likely to get buprenorphine um, and they get it through their primary care physician's office. So think about stigma, right? You have to go to a methadone clinic. That means that you have to get transportation there. You have to be witnessed taking the med. How do you hold a job? How do you take care of your kids? It's incredibly disruptive versus, and you have to go every day, um, versus going to your primary care provider's office, getting a one month or two week supply of buprenorphine. You're anonymous, right? There, there's no stigma like in the waiting room or whatever. Nobody knows that you're getting treatment for this disease unless you want them to know. Um, and so I think those are things that we need to consider and um, encourage uh, our health systems to think about. In uh, University of Michigan, we now have a lot of primary care providers who are waiver trained and providing medication for opiate use disorder for their patients, which um, is a really fantastic thing, but it's not the norm across the country. So this is not an insurmountable problem, um, and certainly hospitals can't fix it in isolation. Um, as communities, as a country, um, we need to take a coordinated um, public health approach. This includes the ED, the hospital, first responders, and law enforcement, um, local health departments, um, of course, SUD providers and behavioral health providers, primary care providers, um, and uh, community organizations. So with that, I am going to invite you to the last um, group of um, breakouts where we're going to talk about harm reduction for those who are not um, interested in stopping to use their substance of choice. Um, we're going to talk about how to include the voices of those with lived experience to inform this work. Um, and we're going to talk about social determinants of health considerations uh, for patients who use drugs. Um, and once again, I'm going to invite any of you who do not yet have your X waiver to go ahead and um, you know, fill out the web application. Uh, it's incredibly easy. It takes less than five minutes. If you're all X waivered, that's fantastic. But you know, tell your colleagues um, that this is a really easy thing to do. There's a really nice FAQ that SAMHSA put together that literally walks you through each screen. Um, and then if you're not sure, um, there are ways of checking whether or not you have your waiver, um, and those are the links to do that. And then, last but not least, this is the Google Drive. We have put together a number of resources, articles on all the topics that we talked about today, as well as um, uh, many of us have shared the protocols that we have in our hospitals um, related to um, take-home naloxone, MOUD, et cetera. The, the thing that's really awesome about this is First of all, Kate is going to try to incorporate some of these resources into the equal website that ASAP maintains. Um, no promises, but she's going to try. Um, and then the second thing is I I'm going to maintain this Google Drive as a resource for my residents, um, and that means that you can use it as well. So, uh, And I invite you, once you access the Google Drive, um, if you have a great resource that you would like to include, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a public good, as it were.